Hi, I'm Nick Lane. Uh, I am the writer of Jane Eyre, the adaptation of which was uh, halted prematurely because of the uh, coronavirus crisis. And I'm here to talk about aspects of the adaptation and the book. No, I was not. Um, I was an actor for a number of years. I started as a child. Uh, not like a child star kind of thing. That was um, not my route. Um, I, my mum was an actress and uh, uh, she introduced me to her agent at a, a, a party, I think, for something she'd done for the BBC. And I'd done school plays. Um, and quite enjoyed them and my mum said oh I think you'd like to be an actor so she got me an audition for Emmerdale Farm when it was called Emmerdale Farm and not just Emmerdale and um, I got the gig I think it was 11 I did a couple of plays <coughs> in Doncaster um, for a company called DAC that don't exist anymore um, and then worked a whole truck when I was 17 um, did some more TV things, a few uh, a Threads, there was a TV thing about nuclear war that I did called Threads, which, you know, was um, shown at our school, and I was horribly, horribly embarrassed, because uh, I was 14 at the time, and um, that was a great film, but uh, at the time I, I, did, I didn't really like our entire school going, oh, you died in a bird shed, <laughs> so yeah, um, and then I suppose the... Uh, most pertinent part of this particular story is that when I was filming for the BBC uh, in 1996 I was in a car accident and um, damaged my back. I already had a pre-existing back disorder which the car accident exacerbated significantly and it meant that I couldn't move as well as other people can move and getting jobs became much harder. So I took a tricky decision uh, to stop and become a writer. I was doing it a little bit anyway. Uh, John Godber, who you ran Holtrop at the time, gave me the opportunity to adapt Frankenstein, and um, that's 20 years ago now. Uh, and as I've often said, you know, the best thing you could probably say about that first adaptation was that it wasn't completely rubbish. It was mostly rubbish. <laughs> But you get better as you go along. And John mentored me through the first couple of projects, and I found my own voice. And um, and yeah, that's the that's the story of that. Well, first and foremost, because it's a brilliant story. Uh, I came to it relatively late, it was in my late twenties before I read it, and um, I was really gripped by it. Uh, intrigued. It's funny. It's satirical. Um, it's very obviously very moving and uh, a fantastic strong protagonist uh, self-determining uh, which is uh, rare I think in literature of its time so it was uh, a great story and I'd already directed a version of it by a, a writer called Laura Turner um, for Hull Truck back in 2013 so I was quite familiar with the story I'd um, revisited the novel in preparation for that so when Adrian uh, Black Eyed Theatre suggested I um, adapt it or uh, you know we work on it together um, it, it seemed to be a, a really uh, good match because I was very keen on doing it and um, wanted to find things uh, within it that I felt at the time when I first when I first read it and subsequently revisited it for, for Laura's adaptation um, you know that the the, the supernatural is that the right word i mean certainly the the sinister and more um unusual elements within the story uh which counterpoint and work with the uh narrative itself that was really really interesting looking at so um it was just a, it was just a great opportunity to um, adapt a fantastic book the facetious answer of course is with great difficulty the National Theatre did a version of Jane Eyre um, ooh, a good few years ago now um, where they broke the book down into two separate made two separate plays out of it because the richness and the denseness of the narrative and the character descriptions are so beautiful and vivid um, I think the National Theatre who have the, the time, the resources and perhaps the will desire to, to make something like that were able to say right we're going to make this episodic and I think the first um, play ran from the beginning of the novel to the point at which Jane arrives at Thornfield Hall 
uh, and then the second part took it from there, obviously to the to the end. Um, I was a bit stating the obvious, wasn't it? Um, I didn't want to do that. Didn't have you know the desire to do that, and I wanted to be able to tell a story. Um, but of course, yeah, there's going to be moments, and and because it is uh, it's art, and art is subjective, and everyone has their favourite moments. I was really, really tortured by what I was going to have to leave out. Some of it, practically, is to do with cast size. Um, you know, because we have a smallish cast and we were able to find ways around that by multi-rolling. Um, but it did mean on occasion. So, for instance, uh, John Reed now only has one sister in the adaptation. Uh, Georgiana, uh, we had to lose the other sister because... Uh, again, the actors were all uh, subscribed at that particular point. Narratively, there were sections that we had to lose. Uh, the one that springs to mind most readily is the uh, section wherein Rochester... Oh, this is a bit of a spoiler. Uh, I'm hoping if you've watched this, uh, you, you know the story and you've already read the book, but Rochester disguises himself as a gypsy woman. Uh, and uh, he and Jane engage in another um, war of words uh, which strengthens their flirtation and so on uh, but it, it, it I struggled with the idea that it, it, you know a, a, a big man dressed as an old woman on stage might look a little farcical so I, I, I omitted that um, truncated some sections obviously you know uh, uh, the the walk that Jane takes when she leaves and she goes to Whitcross and she's found uh, by Sinjin and his sisters uh, Mary and Diana um, was transformed into a montage sequence uh, because in the book it's obviously I think a, a chapter and I didn't have the luxury of the time so just moving it on was real uh, as much as anything else you have to cater when you're writing for audience members who might not have read the book or or have that devotion to the text so what you want to do is create something that drives and, and compels and Jane Eyre is a beautiful beautiful piece of writing and um but it, it is it does have its longer so there are moments that you have to make a choice over um and you know if you're watching this before you've seen the play you might be thinking, oh, I hope I haven't cut out my favourite bit. And if you're watching it afterwards, I hope I didn't. Um, that's a big fingers crossed from me. I mean, it differs. It really does. That's the truth of it. What you have to do, I guess, that is the same, is find something connected to you, something personal. Uh, Jane's struggle, I think, in this. Jane's struggle uh, throughout her life. Um, she is constantly... Uh, underestimated, uh, misunderstood, unfairly blamed, victimised, objectified, uh, and with Rochester she finds something that is on her terms. Yes, initially he's cruel and he's brusque and he plays mind games, um, but he does it because he's testing Jane and at the same time she's testing him. She's, she's playing with him. He grants her an independent will and she gobbles it up. But she doesn't do it because he's given her it. She does it because she wants it. She is not, as she says in the book, she's not an automaton. She isn't uh, devoid of feelings. Uh, and she loves him because she's fallen for him. She's not conforming to the norms of society. And I really liked that. I really liked her when I read it, when I reread it. And uh, in preparation for my own adaptation, I really liked her rebellious and independent spirit. I think that's huge for me. And you always have to find something, like I say. I mean, in um, uh, when I did Frankenstein, uh, just lost my mum, and uh, Victor Frankenstein's quest is initially um, all about finding ways to bring his mum back. Uh, and then Jekyll and Hyde, after my car accident, uh, uh, looked at the text and thought what would happen if somebody said if you drink this potion you'll feel physically robust but you'll be horrible so they're all connected to me personally in, in some ways um, and if you don't have that personal connection it doesn't matter but as long as you can find something that you can bring to the text 
that maybe nobody else had a different way of looking at it, a different way of structuring it, a different way of exploring the characters, or maybe even a different focus for the story. I saw a wonderful uh, adaptation of A Christmas Carol, which I've done two or three times now. Um, but I saw a wonderful adaptation that was done from the ghost of Jacob Marley's uh, point of view, and I thought that was that was fantastic. It was very, very clever. Not something I would do or think of, um, but it made it unique and it made it interesting. And I think that's the key. You know, you can get very, very serviceable versions of plays that uh, work and are correct chronologically and so on and so forth. But it, I think it's about bringing your, your personality, whether it's playfulness, sinister uh, elements to the text or whatever. It's, it's that that I think people will grab onto. And that's what I would want to always suggest you bring if you're adapting a book. Up until this moment, um, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. I have actually used a couple of things that have happened to me in my life uh, as um, material for plays, uh, mining my own deep psychology. Uh, my favourite summer was a play about me working in a scaffolding warehouse back in the 1990s with a man who terrified me. Um, and then uh, a play called Me and My Dad, which was all about my mum's death and ostensibly it's about me moving back in with my dad which I did to try and teach him how to cook but it was really about living with loss and learning to cope with the loss of a family member uh, but it as a whole my life uh, I, don't, I don't know I, I, honestly I don't know lucky maybe uh, I, I mean, I was in a car accident, so maybe not that lucky. <laughs> well, there you go, there's a the title. Lucky, but not that lucky. <laughs> and that'll do. Oh, uh, wow. Um, I'd toss my wife this, to be honest, uh, because uh, I, I, I had no idea. I would pick Denzel Washington uh, because he's a fantastic actor, but he is absolutely nothing like me. He's way cooler, much more handsome and more talented than Swine. Um, so... <laughs> Um, outside of Denzel um, Simon Pegg my wife said my wife said uh, yeah just, just so he's got again he's, he's got more hair uh, than me uh, and he's not from the north but he's pretty good with accents so I would go with Simon Pegg yeah why not good guy I think okay that's all from me so thank you so much for watching uh, I hope you've enjoyed this I hope it's uh, illuminated certain things or at least uh, helped pass the time um, do stay safe everybody and hopefully I'll see you soon thanks very much bye